Good afternoon. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ho, ho, ho. I am at Harvard Divinity School, the home of the call and response. And I said good afternoon. So I'm going to just... I'm going to act like that didn't happen. We're going to start this again. I know people are trickling in. You just got your coffee. You're completely overwhelmed because Gloria White Hammond is amazing. gave this great presentation. So we're going to do this one more time. Good afternoon. Oh, that sounds better. Okay, good. So um, you guys are lucky enough to be here at a historical moment where we are finally recognizing as an institution the contributions of the fair species. That would be women. Okay. I didn't get a response. Okay. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you a woman who, you know, when I got the opportunity to meet her yesterday, I had no idea that she existed on the planet, but that's, that's sort of what happens with amazing women, right? We're kind of off doing our thing, and nobody really knows we're around until somebody decides, oh, you should know this person. So I started to think about how to introduce her, and then I thought about other amazing women. So I kind of went down my little mental Rolodex of women who sort of dare to do mighty things. Now, her mighty things are a little bit different than some other women. You know, Toni Morrison dared to write about the black female experience, and she was recognized with a Nobel Prize in Literature for Beloved. Shirley Chisholm dared to run for president, unbought and unbossed. Actually, I had a professor here, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, who dared to show up in a classroom one day, as hyper-prepared as she always is, without her notes, and she did a lecture on reconstruction from her memory that floored me to this day. I, I found that to be pretty daring and mighty. Um, and my own mother, who has a ninth grade education and a GED, raised me to be the woman who stands before you today. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. She owns her own home and she owns her own car, and I think that's pretty mighty. And then we have Tori. So Tori is sort of like the classic overachiever that we kind of look at at school and we're just like, oh, here she comes again. <laughs> How are we ever going to compare to her? Let's just be friends with her and maybe it'll rub off. So uh, when Terry said, I have to go, but you're going to introduce her, I, I read her bio and I was like, most assuredly, this will be an honor. So Terry, we're happy to have you here. Terry graduated from Smith College. She has a master's in divinity from Harvard Divinity School, a Juris Doctorate from the University of Louisville School of Law, and a master's degree in fine arts <laughs> in writing from Spalding University. Got another one coming? <laughs> I don't have an earned doctorate. <laughs> I think somebody should just give you a doctorate at this point. Uh, she's admitted to practice law in 1995 and is a lawyer in good standing. You know that's really important these days. <laughs> With the Kentucky Bar Association. She is currently the Vice President of External Relations, Enrollment Management, and Student Affairs at Spalding University, where she supervises multiple departments, of course we knew that, initiatives, and other aspects of community life at the school. So here's where it really gets interesting. Like, she's amazing and all these other things, but then on top of all of that, Terry is well known as the first woman and first American to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> But wait, 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 wait. It gets better. It gets better. It gets better. She was also the first woman and first American to travel over land to the geographic South Pole. Wait a minute. Skiing. Step skiing. Skiing. I'm black girl skiing. Okay. 740 miles from the ice shelf to the pole. Okay, okay, that's not enough. In addition to that, she's an avid mountaineer and has climbed on several continents and was the first woman to climb the Lewis Nunatuck Summit in Antarctica. So, I mean, I could say more, and I'm sure she'll enlighten you all. Um, and she's so humble that it's really funny, so I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Because, you know, who follows that? But I wanted to introduce to you a woman who has worked with one of my heroes, Muhammad Ali, 
and has also crossed the globe without help of a plane, train, automobile, anything. Ms. Tori McClurk. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, unfortunately, the Sudan has done it to me again. Uh, I spoke a few weeks ago. I serve on the Board of Trustees at Smith College, and I was charged that evening with um, roasting and toasting some of the outgoing trustees. But the presentation over dinner was from a professor who works in the Sudan, who has worked actively in the Sudan, and, and the point of the presentation was to convince the Smith Board of Trustees to divest from companies doing business in Sudan wasn't a tough decision. There were only two companies in the Smith portfolio doing business. But, you know, we listened to a, a chilling evening, and though there was wine at the tables, we were quite sober. And then I had to stand and shift gears into something with a little less gravitas. And this morning, I followed the Sudan yet again. <laughs> and uh, I assure you, I am perfectly capable of, capable of bringing gravitas to a podium, but that was not my choice when I put together my remarks for this morning. Um, it is an important issue. We have some of the lost boys of Sudan at Spalding University in Louisville, Kentucky. So this is a, this is a broad-ranging issue. Anyway, when I was asked to or honored with the invitation to come and speak here today, I was a little puzzled because I thought, well, I was a good student at HDS, but it wasn't as if I distinguished myself as a scholar. You know, I, I'm not a great theologian. I, I don't lead any particular community of faith. And then my friend Terry Mulry said, well, Tori, you know, you did take off two and a half months in the middle of your school year to ski to the South Pole while you were at HDS. <laughs> I was like, Okay. So, Terry, what you're really saying, now I wish Terry was here because it's more important if you knew Terry Mulry, you know. So, Terry, you're telling me at an event to honor women, you're inviting me for my body and not my mind. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed, I was sitting in this very room. I had gone downstairs to get my mail and come into class. I was sitting in this very room when I opened the invitation that uh, asked me to become a member of the expedition team that was going to ski to the geographical South Pole. So then, of course, I needed to think of an excuse for taking off two and a half months in the middle of my last year here. So I went to my thesis advisor, and I knocked on the door. Excuse me, Professor Eckel. My name is Tori Merton. I know who you are. <laughs> Well, sir, I was wondering if it might be possible to take off a little time here during my last year to do some field research for my thesis. <laughs> Ms. Murden, what is your thesis topic? The theology of adventure. <laughs> Ms. Murden, where are you planning on doing this field research? Antarctica? <laughs> Ms. Murden, there are no theological libraries in the Antarctic. What are you up to? And I explained that no woman and no American had ever traveled overland to the geographic South Pole. Women and Americans had been there, but they'd all used airplanes, and that seemed like cheating somehow. <laughs> and I was sure that if he gave me permission that I could ski 740 miles across the highest, driest, coldest continent on the face of the planet. We were literally going to traverse the side of Antarctica that had not been crossed before. I was, was going to put my foot down where no one had walked in the last hundred million years. He said, Tori, if you can get permission from the dean, it's okay with me. So I went to Dean Thiemann. I gave him the same story. And he looked at me upstairs. He looked at me over his glasses and said, in the 350 years of Harvard <laughs> University, students have gone to great lengths for thesis topics, but this has got to be a record. <laughs> and he let me go. I had to work some things out, like Professor Preston Williams was kind enough to let me turn in some papers late for my because uh, I left at Thanksgiving and came back in January. Now, I had a reputation here of being, well, I may not have been the best student in anyone's classes, but I was one of the more interesting students. And I was something of a practical joker. There was a group of us that lived in Div Hall and... Um, we created a certain amount of mayhem. Right before Easter, we went around and wrote on every blackboard at the Divinity School, Easter is canceled, they found the body. 
<laughs> it was a joke. God has a sense of humor. Look around. So, you know, when one is engaged in practical jokes, they somehow get played on one from time to time. So I had some friends here at the Divinity School put together some cassette tapes for me to take with me when I went to Antarctica because, you know, you're skiing nine hours a day. You might want some entertainment. So I'm a classical music fan, can't stand schmaltzy, kind of sappy stuff, just can't abide it. Got to Antarctica, and I put a tape into my Walkman that said, Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. And instead of Tchaikovsky, I heard, to dream the impossible dream. <laughs> it was Man of La Mancha. I am 2,000 miles from the nearest tree, let alone record store, and I've got Man of La Mancha on my tape deck. <laughs> hey, but after 740 miles, it kind of grows on you. <laughs> so the theme for my remarks this morning will come from Man of La Mancha, to dream the impossible dream. We crossed the side of Antarctica that had never been traversed. There were those who said it was impossible. I subscribed to the theory that the impossible merely takes longer. <laughs> it wasn't easy. There was wind. The wind blows north off the polar plateau toward the ocean, so we were always skiing into a headwind. Sometimes the wind blew 70 miles an hour. It was the kind of wind that reduced you to a crawling thing. You had to yell to be heard a few feet away. Um, there were crevasses, great breaks in the ice that could go down a few feet or could go down a few hundred feet. You didn't know until you stepped into one. <laughs> the average temperature was minus 25, and then there was this lovely stuff called sastrugi. These are the waves and bumps in the ice. Antarctica is a, technically a desert. doesn't really get that much snowfall, but plenty of snow blows, and it blows into these big mounds and look like ocean waves. And as you're trying to ski over sastrugi, Imagine skiing around the living room. First you ski over a couple of toys on the floor, or books. This is more of a book crowd. Ski over a few books on the floor. Tiny sastrugi, insignificant. Ski over the coffee table, small sastrugi. Ski over the couch, medium-sized sastrugi. If you want to get a feel for what it's like to ski over a big sastrugi, try skiing over a bookcase or two. We skied nine hours a day, seven days a week. Skied on Christmas Day, skied on New Year's Day. Now, I was in my mid-twenties, and like most people in their mid-twenties, I was convinced that I was utterly incapable of making mistakes. And there were seven different days when we traveled in whiteout conditions. And whiteouts happen when the clouds come down on the surface of the snow. Don't go anywhere without your glacier glasses on. Go snow blind. Clouds come down on the surface of the snow. Up is white, down is white, left is white, right is white, and you literally cannot see the ground in front of you. And how you navigate is you send the youngest member of the expedition team out off into the mist. And because she's standing on the ground and you can see her, you're perfectly happy. But if you're the one out off in the mist, you're falling down. One day I lifted my ski to ski over what I thought was a hill and fell into a deep depression. The light was so flat I couldn't tell the difference between up or down. And how you navigate is you take your compass and you look for any landmark, a flake of snow, a piece of sastrugi, some color variation that's due south, and you ski to that landmark, and then you find another, and you ski to that landmark, and you go from point to point to point. Well, this one day I was really excited because I had a perfect landmark due south, 180 degrees. And I skied right toward it, and I skied right toward it, and I skied right toward it. And Colonel Ron Milnarek of the United States Air Force was my second that day, and his job was to correct any deviations in my course. And Ron said, Tori, you're veering right. <laughs> no, I know how to use compass. <laughs> Checked it again. No, my landmark was perfect. Skied right toward it, skied right toward it, skied right toward it. Tori, you're veering right. <laughs> no. Just to humor him, I'm going to check one more time, but I am utterly infallible. It does not happen. <laughs> I'm a divinity student at Harvard, after all. <laughs> check my compass. Now, this is a mountaineering compass that has a mirror otherwise known as an idiot's compass. To, it shows you who's lost. <laughs> so I checked my compass again. Skied right toward my landmark. Skied right toward my landmark. Skied right toward my landmark. Tori, you're veering right. That's it. He's a dead man. Going to have to kill him. I never veer right. I'm a real Democrat. I may be from the South, but I don't veer right. <laughs> okay, for the Republicans in the room, I see you. I married a Republican, okay? 
Um, so I turned to give Colonel Ron Milnarik of the United States Air Force my very best Merton desk air. And when I did that, I realized my landmark off in the mist was a spot of frost on my glacier glasses. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when that happens? But that experience has been symbolic. Every time I'm absolutely sure I know the way to go and absolutely sure people should follow me, I think, okay, maybe I should stop and clean my glasses. Vaclav Havel uh, once said, keep the company and seek the company of those who are searching after truth and run away from the people who think they have found it. <laughs> so if there were really difficult days in the Antarctic when the, the wind was blowing us toward the ocean and the uh, ice was crusted in our... Our, our eyes, and there were plenty of times when you think about quitting. But during those times, it was easy to think about all the people who broke the trail for me, not necessarily that trail in the Antarctic. The Antarctic explorers had been on the other side of the continent, but the women who broke the trail, Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, Marie Curie and Margaret Mead, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Jeanette Rankin and Gold in My Ear, better women, stronger women. I accepted the challenge of a continent, but those women did things far more daring. They challenged the thinking of their eras. After all, our brains are more important than our bodies. You know, I don't think it really matters if a woman is skied to the South Pole, and I know it doesn't matter if a woman's rode across the Atlantic Ocean. But while skiing to the Pole, I learned patience the patience required to take on the more, far more challenging and far more important things that happen in the civilized world. On January 17, 1989, I and other members of the expedition team became the first Americans and first women, there was another woman on the journey, to reach the South Pole by an overland route. And I returned here and wrote my thesis, a thesis that balanced the backcountry adventure with what I believed to be the far more important urban adventure. To dream, the impossible dream, the next line on that idiotic cassette tape was to fight the unbeatable foe. As I said, the greatest challenges exist here in civilization. We may not all row across oceans, but we all have oceans to cross. We all face waves, we all tangle with storms that twist our lives and slam us into bone-crunching bulkheads. We succeed one action at a time, stroke after stroke, step after step, phone call after phone call. We traverse the distance between possibility and fact. At our best, we attempt to close the gap between the promise of humanity and the performance of human beings. Now, I learned about this chasm between promise and performance when I was working with mentally handicapped adults. And I worked with a woman named Karen. And my goal for the summer was to teach Karen how to say yes or no. Very simple thing. Yes or no. So every day at a certain time, I would take Karen to a certain place, and I would say, Karen, do you want a drink of water? And Karen would say, <laughs> And the next day, I'd say, Karen, do you want a drink of water? <laughs> this went on for an entire summer, and I was very tired one day, and Karen was very tired, and I took her to that same spot, and I said, Karen, do you want a drink of water? Yes or no? And Karen said, take me to the kitchen, get a drink of water. Karen, did you just say, take me to the kitchen and get a drink of water? Give me to the kitchen, get a drink of water. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, she was speaking, and I was speaking, and she and it was amazing. Now, I was still rather young there, so when I went to bed that night, I was so proud of myself. I was thinking, I wonder what Karen is pondering now that I've taught her how to talk. <laughs> Came to me as if in a dream, Karen's been thinking I've been speaking to this idiot all summer, and now she can understand. <laughs> How many voices do we fail to hear because we are listening for something that we expect or listening for a particular agenda and we're not hearing the person who's right in front of us? The individuals before us are magical. Now, we each have our own definitions of sin. I consider sin the gap between what we are and all that we are capable of being. This reminds me and tells me conclusively that I am a sinner. Now, I think there are basically three sorts of people in my world. I'm sure you all have far more complicated worlds. <laughs> Mine, I can reduce to three. 
There are those who sit by and watch adventures happen. These are the mall muffins of the spectator society. And while this might be better than sitting around pulling the wings off of flies, I am not entirely sure. (laughs) There's a second category in which I place myself, and I imagine most of you fit into this category. There are those who have adventures. But there's a third category to which I aspire. There are those who are adventures. Now, I know some of the faculty members here are adventures. But when I think of adventures, I think of a woman named Henrietta D'Angeville, who was the first woman to climb Mont Blanc. She climbed Mont Blanc in 1836. And I know she was an adventurer because she climbed Mont Blanc wearing a feather boa. (laughs) She did this because she wanted to be sure that the men waiting in the lodge at the foot of the mountain could see her through their telescopes. (laughs) You go, girl. (laughs) Now... We are all capable of being adventurers. It doesn't take any brilliance to be an adventurer. Now, I learned this the same summer I worked with Karen. I worked with another woman who was quite happy with me one day, and I'm glad this is mostly an audience of women because the women will get it. Gentlemen, I'm sorry. I'm leaving you out. It happens from time to time. This woman came up to me, and she goes, I like you. I like you a lot. I like you. You are underwear. Why, thank you. I've always wanted to be called underwear. (laughs) And I didn't understand it until a few weeks later when she was less amused with me. She said, I don't like you anymore. I don't like you anymore. No, you are meanie. I don't like you anymore. You are (laughs) pantyhose. So when I'm driving down the street... In Louisville, Kentucky, you know, it's not dangerous in Kentucky it's like it is here. I mean, I'd be able to use this line a lot more in Boston, but somebody cuts me off. I don't roll down the window and shout unpleasant things. I roll down the window and I say, you are pity holes! <laughs> and if their behavior was particularly egregious, I shout, you are control top pantyhose! <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm sorry. You just don't get it. (laughs) To fight the unbeatable foe, the next line in that song was to bear the unbearable sorrow. After I graduated from HDS, I ran a shelter for homeless women. My first day working at the shelter, I uh, ran into a woman who was roaring drunk, and by the rules of the organization I worked for, I was supposed to throw her out. But she was every bit as tall as I am and much bigger than I am. And I felt this strange feeling, and I couldn't quite place it, but I remembered right before I started divinity school, I spent a summer living in Kenya. And I traveled with a Maasai, actually two Maasai in particular, one named Moses, the other named Daniel. Yes, the missionaries had been in that part of Kenya. (laughs) And Moses knew I was a woman. He was pretty cool with that. Daniel was sure I was a man. He was pretty cool with that. Moses convinced me if I let Daniel find out I was a woman, I would not be hiking with them. So things got complicated. We were hiking through this area, and Daniel says, Morefu, they called me Morefu, it's Swahili for tall. Morefu, there has been a leopard in this area, leopard. Leopards are mbayasana, very bad. We must kill this leopard. I'm thinking, endangered species. Sure, Daniel, whatever you say. Now, I didn't think anything would come of this until a few nights later, when Daniel comes in to wake me up, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning. Marifu, Marifu, let us go and kill this leopard. Let us kill it now. I'm like, Daniel, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to go leopard hunting. He starts teasing me as if to say, what are you, a woman? <laughs> <laughs> but I take my rungu, which apparently is so hazardous that Homeland Security had to remove it from my bag. It is a stick with a knob on the end of it. Now, I had my rungu, and Daniel had his spear. I have never prayed so fervently in my life. Dear God, you know, we take this goat, we go out in the woods, we tie the goat to the tree, the goat's going, meh, meh, I'm going, shut up, shut up. (laughs) Dear God, if this Maasai fails to kill this leopard with his spear, you got a white woman with a stick. (laughs) And Smith College was very good, but they didn't teach me anything about killing leopards with a stick. (laughs) Fortunately for me, the leopard didn't show up, and I lived to tell the story. Back to that homeless shelter. The feeling I was feeling that morning was fear. And I recognized Terence, the Greek poet, 
who was born a slave and later free, once wrote, I am a human being, therefore nothing human can be alien to me. And I remembered that as I was standing there with that woman. I don't know what it's like to live on the street. I don't know what it's like to be beaten. If guy hits me, I'm going to hit him back and I'm going to hurt him. <laughs> she doesn't know what it's like to hunt a leopard with a stick. But we both understood fear. And in that, we made a connection with one another. And after a few weeks of living in a safe, secure, sanitary environment, this woman was write, writing amazing poetry. Not amazing poetry for a homeless woman. Amazing poetry. Um, we're running short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. After I w- worked for the shelter for a while, um, I recognized that I needed a little more firepower in my quest for social justice. So I went to law school with a plan of learning the language of the enemy. And uh, as Terry Mulry said at the time, he goes, hey, Tor, you know, MDiv, law school, you can give twice the advice for half the price. (laughs) And when I was in law school, I took a job working for the mayor of Louisville, trying to turn around distressed neighborhoods. One day, I was walking down the hall with the mayor, and he says, got your lizard skin shoes on, I see. I thought, I wear a size 12. These aren't even leather. They're not lizard skin. But you don't argue with the mayor. So I said, yes, sir, staying on top of things, sir. (laughs) Now, I always thought I was sort of delicate and, you know, demure in how I handled myself in the mayor's office. He turns to the police officer on his other side and says, she probably skinned the lizards with her bare hands. (laughs) Well, I have to admit, I have always adopted as my creed, and it is where I took the title from this speech, words of Theodore Roosevelt, who wrote, Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Say what you like about me, I don't live in the gray twilight. (laughs) I passed the bar exam and kept working for the mayor, and I worked on an empowerment zone application, a $100 million, it was for a $100 million federal, federal grant. Now, you, that's some serious walking around money in Kentucky. You can make a difference with an extra $100 million. Well, we were assured that the political process was going to be very clean, and we would all have an equal shot, and I bought it because I'm an idiot. We wrote the best empowerment zone application, hands down. There was no question we were going to get it. No, they went to Atlanta and Chicago and Detroit and L.A., and Well, I was depressed. So I needed to get over it, so I took my rowboat, and I went to the Atlantic Ocean, and I put my rowboat in, and then I tried to row to France. (laughs) Well, okay, so there's a little more to it than that. To bear the unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go. I uh, spent three years, actually, building and rebuilding this boat to row across the Atlantic Ocean. My first try, I tried to row the hard way, going from the United States to France, west to east, This is known as the hard way because the currents and the winds are not all that helpful going across the northern route. Um, I left Nags Head, North Carolina because the Gulf Stream travels pretty close to there, and I figured if I got in the Gulf Stream, I would have this warm water current pushing me most of the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, my plan for this counted on my satellite telephone. We discussed satellite telephones in the earlier meeting. Working for two and a half months. Well, eight days from shore, I had my first capsize. In my first capsize, the boat flipped upside down. My satellite telephone got wet. Expensive electronics and salt water do not go together. (laughs) Because of that accident, I went for 78 days with no contact with anyone on land. And when I lost communications, I lost the Gulf Stream. And when I lost the Gulf Stream, the boat stopped. When you are rowing a 2,000-pound rowboat with two oars, You go at walking pace. Imagine walking across the Atlantic Ocean. (laughs) I'm going to show you a quick video about the trip, and then I'll come finish up. With Hurricane Mitch bearing down on Central America, imagine being there in a rowboat. Well, that's something like what happened to one brave woman on a record-setting effort. Here's April Wilson. 34-year-old Victoria Murden of Louisville, Kentucky, embodies an all-American spirit of adventure. 
but with her video camera rolling, her quest to push the limits of her own endurance nearly killed her. I've been thirsty and I've been hungry and God knows I'm scared. Normally, Tori is accustomed to racing on calmer water. But in October 1997, she was approached by Sector, an Italian company known for its extreme no-limits competition. The challenge? To be the first woman to row solo across an ocean. The proposition was intimidating. To, to row the North Atlantic, uh, going west to east, is no cakewalk. On June 14th, Tori Merton took the first strokes in a 3,600-mile odyssey from North Carolina to France aboard a 23-foot boat she named the American Pearl. I knew that, okay, in the next three months, it's just me and this boat on this wide, wide piece of water. That is my dessert for the evening. Tori packed 120 freeze-dried meals and a solar-powered desalinator provided fresh water. At the end of 58 days, Tori had rowed more than halfway across the Atlantic, but of all the obstacles she faced, none proved more menacing than the fury of the sea. I'd been through some pretty heavy storms and capsized three times. I'll take my word for it, these waves are just a little too big. When Tori did capsize, the American Pearl was designed to right itself, and though terrified, her waterproof cabin kept her safe. A big wave would come over the top, and it would spin the boat. And then I'd be upside down for a couple of seconds, and the boat would rock, and then it would eventually roll back upright. I'm outside in the water! For inspiration, Tori kept a piece of home close by. That little flag on that boat took such a beating, and it was so comforting to look out on deck in the morning and see that flag still there. But the weather steadily worsened, and while we breathed a sigh of relief as Hurricane Danielle passed by the East Coast on September 5th, Tori was brutally engulfed by the storm. 6.30 a.m., um, I'm definitely something big and bad my way. 30-foot waves slammed into Tori's boat, tossing her like a rag doll. Smash into the boat, and there would be this chaos that would ensue. The boat turning, and things flying around the cabin. And when I was capsized, I took the rib off the top of my ceiling with my uh, back. I was absolutely sure that I was not going to live through the storm. I was absolutely convinced that my life was over. I'm going to live, I'm going to die on the whim of nature, and uh, that's that, huh? Frightened, Tori uttered what she thought may have been her last words. Go ahead and chase your dreams. I mean, they don't always work out right, but go ahead and chase your dreams. you got to do it. Though fear was evident in her eyes and in her voice, Tori resisted activating her distress beacon. And I thought, I can't ask another human being to come out into this storm and get me. I've lost track of the number of capsizes. But after 11 capsizes in 12 hours and a severe shoulder injury, Tori signaled for help. I was so badly beaten that, you know, I, I didn't think I could make it through another storm. The container ship Independent Spirit en route to Philadelphia came to her rescue and plucked her from the churning seas some 900 miles from France. I was fighting back tears because I thought, this is the wrong shore and this is the wrong boat. But the folks in Philadelphia gave Tori a hero's welcome. And I was dumbfounded because in my mind, I had failed to do what I, I had set out to do. We all face oceans. We all run into those big waves. We all hit storms. And it doesn't seem like you're going to make it through. Actually, Tori did set a record. Her 85 days rowing alone at sea are the longest for any American. <laughs> there are a few mistakes in the tape. It's inside edition after all. Um, <laughs> One mistake has to do with the timing of my rescue. I went through 11 capsizes the day Hurricane Danielle hit, which was September the 5th. I didn't call for rescue until September the 7th. The morning the storm hit, I went through five or six capsizes. Um, some of them were fairly violent. Two were end-over-end -end pitch poles. One capsize dislocated my shoulder. The next capsize put it back into place. LAUGHTER 
this is my personal definition of a bad day. Um, and I just, I was in the cabin, a watertight cabin in the stern, and I kept my emergency position indicating radio beacon on the bow bulkhead. It's a e, better known as an EPIRB to the sailors among you. It has one switch. You turn the switch on, it says, HELP! You don't turn anything on, nothing happens. I deliberately put it as far away from the cabin as possible so that I couldn't set it off in a raving panic. I would have to think about it. I would have to get out of the cabin, tie into my safety tether, crawl across the deck to get the EPIRB. I did indeed. Decided it was time to leave, got out of the cabin, crawled across the deck, got the EPIRB, and the time it took me to get across the deck, several waves washed over the boat, the boat submarined a few times, and I thought, I can't ask another human being to come get me. Took the EPIRB, tied it to my life vest, crawled back across the deck, went back into the cabin, and I went through six or seven more capsizes that day without setting off a distress beacon that was in one hand, not pushing the button with the other. That was the hardest thing I'd ever done. So I get a little miffed when they say, ah, 11 capsizes, she called for help. I waited for two days for the winds to die down and for the waves to subside, and then I called for help. A second hurricane, Hurricane Earl, passed well north of me and set off a couple of rogue waves that capsized me four more times the morning of September 7th. And by that time, I hadn't slept in about a week. And sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation does some pretty strange things for you. So I did indeed set off my distress beacon. Um, the independent spirit came and picked me up. Hurricane Danielle, the other mistake in the tape, has to do with the wave height. The center of Hurricane Danielle passed within 40 miles of my position. I was hit by both eye walls. <coughs> when I got home, though, all I knew was in the general area of Hurricane Danielle, the waves were 35 or 40 feet. That's what I'd heard from the Weather Service. So when I got home, all the press wanted to know was, how big were the waves? Well, my boat sits four feet out of the water. Anything over 25 feet looked really big. I said, they were really big. It wasn't good enough. They wanted a number. And so I said, I don't know, maybe 35 or 40 feet. Being a woman, they figured I exaggerated, so they made them 30 feet. The waves were 30 feet. In doing some research, I learned that at the, area, at the eye walls, the average wave height was 70 feet. The maximum wave height was 126 feet. They were really big. The conditions were not unlike those depicted in the film The Perfect Storm, only I feel compelled to remind you George Clooney was on a sound stage and I was in a rowboat. <laughs> So I get home, you know, and the record of 85 days alone at sea is a record of dubious merit, because if you row quickly, it doesn't take 85 days to get across the Atlantic Ocean. I rowed, um, I had a tracking beacon aboard the boat that recorded that a fact that I had rowed 3,400 miles. Now, I only made it 2,600 miles because winds and currents kept driving me backwards. And so I made it to within 900 miles of France. I came home. Uh, the one fringe benefit of the summer was I went for 91 days the summer of 1998 without ever hearing the name Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> you know, when I left, Madeleine Albright was standing on the White House lawn saying, the president says he didn't do it, and I believe him. Well, I believed her. <laughs> I came home. The, uh, I arrived home the Sunday morning after the Star Report was released, and it was the first newspaper I saw. <laughs> He did what? She did what? They did what? <laughs> I missed that slow, steady build up across the summer where people just didn't care. Brings me to, to run where the brave not, dare not go. The next line in the song is to right the unrightable wrong. I returned to an America that was far sadder and more cynical than the one I had left the beginning of that summer. I, too, was sadder and more cynical. I believed I had failed, which... It was almost a fate worse than death in my mind, and it was a small and shallow mind, which I hope has grown a little bit since then. And I took a job. The mayor for whom I worked had to leave office because of a term limit, and I took a job working for the boxer Muhammad Ali. And working for Muhammad reminded me that, you know, a failure isn't a person who falls. A failure is a person who doesn't get back up again. You can't be the world champion three times if you don't lose twice. And Mohammed was asking, he's like, you know, Tori, how far is it across the Atlantic? It's like, well, if you go across the mid-Atlantic, it's about 3,300 miles. He said, how far did you row? 3,400 miles. He said, so you did it. I was like, well, not really. He said, well, you've got to go back because, you know, you don't want to go through life as the woman who almost rode across the Atlantic. And he was right. 
There was news that two women were going to try the safer, easier route going east to west from Africa to the Caribbean. It's the easier way because the trade winds blow east to west. They have always blown east to west. From Columbus, you can leave the coast of Africa in a barrel. You will get to the Caribbean. If you row, you'll get there a little faster. I am mindful of the time. We will finish by 11.15, but you may not have time for questions, but I'm going to charge on. So... On September 13, 1999, I pushed off the island of Tenerife in my boat, the American Pearl. The boat had been rescued. I'd rebuilt it, sent it overseas. At the same time, from the same harbor, a Norwegian woman left in a boat of similar design. We pushed off. About 45 minutes later, all the press boats left, and we, I couldn't see Diana Hoff any longer. Once again, I rode beyond the reach and gazed on a horizon that looks just like it did before the existence of man. From that point on, I was alone. There weren't any chase vessels. No one dropped food or equipment to me along the way. Between nasty weather systems, I enjoyed idyllic days and nights. I would get up at dawn. Well, I'd get up before dawn so I could be at the oars when the sun came up. After about an hour and a half later, I would stop and have breakfast, almost always granola. I'd row to lunch. Five-minute break for breakfast, five-minute break for lunch. If I'd been at the oars when the sun came up at 3.30, I got to have my junk food break when I'd eat cashews or M&Ms or any of the goodies I'd brought aboard. One afternoon, I ate an entire week's ration worth of Triscuits just listening to the sound of the crunch. <laughs> Can you say boredom? <laughs> I'd row till dinner. At dinner, I took a leisurely 20-minute break from the oars. And then I would row till the bottom of the sun touched the top of the water. And there were days, I swear, it stopped a quarter of an inch above the surface of the water and would not go down. <laughs> As I prepared the boat for the evening, I could watch the sunset light up the full dome of the sky. Um, I rode through rising mists, followed rainbows, tracked the flights of shooting stars. At night, you could see the, the highway of the Milky Way charging across the night sky. And my favorite times were when the phosphorescence would light up the water beneath the boat, uh, uh, phosphorescent, bioluminescent shrimp and plankton. And you'd see this. Dolphins would be leaping around the boat, and I couldn't see the dolphins, but I could see the flames of phosphorescent light following them through the water. It was really extraordinary. During the day, sea turtles would come and visit. They'd come. They'd hang around, some of them the size of coffee tables. They'd visit for a while, and then they would pass me. <laughs> The most ridiculous looking creatures were the Portuguese men of war. They looked like Ziploc bags full of cotton candy. And the first time I saw one, I thought, oh, it's trash. I'm going to pick it up and take it home because I promised all these school kids I was going to, you know, I wasn't going to throw anything overboard. And here was this little plastic bag I was going to pick it up. Reached over and I noticed it had tentacles. And I thought, I think I'll leave that alone. <laughs> By far, my favorite encounters, though, were with whales. One day I was rowing along. It was a fairly rough day. And there was a lot of waves crashing around. And I smelled this really sour, fishy smell. And I thought, whew, I need a bath. <laughs> and I kept rowing. And I smelled that smell again. I'm like, man, I really need a bath. And I looked down and this parking lot surfaced on the starboard side of the boat. It was a sperm whale. I was smelling whale breath. And it was three times the size of the boat, six inches away, just hovered, never touched the boat. I pulled in my starboard oar so I wouldn't touch it. It might touch me back. And it hovered and then drifted out and swam slowly away. Not long after that, I was, um, I was about 400 miles from Guadeloupe, my destination, uh, when the trade winds stopped blowing. And I got a telephone call. I had four redundant communication systems on the second trip. It was one of the things my friends insisted upon. And my, a friend from Kentucky called and said, Tori, there's a ha, there's a there's a her, her, hurricane in the Caribbean, and it seems to be heading in your direction. I said, no, 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 no. I've done my homework. I always do my homework. No hurricane in recorded history has ever traveled west to east at this latitude. It does not happen. All hurricanes go east to west. They go east to west because the trade winds blow east to west. The trade winds reversed themselves. Hurricane Lanny was the first hurricane in recorded history to travel 1,000 miles west to east. It passed directly over my boat. Fortunately for me, the waves were 30 feet. I had one capsize. It was a gentle capsize. I went heels overhead. You always want to go heels overhead. 
If you go head over heels, your face hits the ceiling first. If you go heels over head, your knees hit the ceiling first. And on the second trip, I padded the ceiling. <laughs> first trip, I didn't expect to spend so much time on the ceiling. <laughs> so the storm passed, and uh, which brings me to the next line of the song, to right the unrightable wrong, to love pure and chaste from afar. After that hurricane passed, I picked up that satellite telephone. I called the guy named Mac McClure, and I said, Mac, this love, pure and chase from afar thing is for the birds. When I get out of this rowboat, will you marry me? And he said, yes. Now, he tells the story differently. He says, I called before the hurricane, and he was under duress. (laughs) (laughs) Hurricane Lenny was really not that much of a storm. It terrified me, because I was expecting Hurricane Danielle. But I will think of Hurricane Danielle, that first hurricane, as one of the more meaningful experiences in my life. It was my first real brush with death, my first experience of the sublime, mighty power and glory of nature. And when I came home feeling like a failure, it was, it was actually a good thing for me. Each of us is a blend of dust and divinity. I thought I leaned a little toward the divine before the hurricane. Each is mortal, each heroic. Well, when I came home, I recognized the romance in being merely human. Only equals can be friends, and the only friends worth having are the ones who understand our brokenness. Before the hurricane, I was respected. After the hurricane, I was loved. Love is better. To love, pure and chaste from afar, the last line I will bother you with, to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star. When I came home, I uh, ran into all the folks who helped me, the people I think of as the pearls in the American Pearl. I was shocked to realize how many school children had followed my journey. I was sending out uh, logs via email. Now, maintaining communications made all the difference for me. So I hope that you will be able to communicate with one another and return to whatever you do revived and ready to rekindle your fires. I commend you for being here. I commend you for your achievements and the achievements you are yet to make. I challenge you to be adventurers. We will not arrive immediately. There are no 60-minute roads to to solutions or change. As I skid to the South Pole, there was an Indian member of the expedition, a colonel from the Indian Army, and J.K. would always say, slowly and steadily. We will get there, but we must get there by going slowly and steadily. If we come to a storm, we will put our heads down and keep walking, but we must, absolutely must, go slowly and steadily. (laughs) So I have every confidence that when you leave here, you will go out, you will continue to teach, heal, feed, and build. You will inform, advocate, comfort, and guide. You will criticize, you will organize, you will contribute, and in a hundred other ways, you will serve people and causes, and for that, I thank you. She is, in fact, tenacious and amazing and wonderful, and I teared up just listening to that because, of course, I'm an urban girl, so that's, that's all way too much for me. Um, but thank you. Uh, we're going to take a couple of quick questions. As you know, we um, are a little bit pressed for time. So two people who have amazingly um, awesome questions who will uh, summarize some things for all of us that we're feeling about the experience of Terry, because that was an experience. I hope you guys felt what I did. Um, I need you to speak into a microphone because we are actually she, she taping. Loud. She's got to go with the microphone. We're taping. Oh, I'm sorry, we're taping, so I need you to get to the microphone. Here we come. Oh, okay. um, you mentioned uh, concentrating on the granola crunch, and I'm wondering how you prepared mentally for all of this, and what was going on? What practices, what you were doing, doing all this? Yeah. Well, well, while I joke that, you know, you invited me here for my body and not my mind, the most difficult part of the journey was the solitude. Um, Being alone for two and a half months in a rowboat is a difficult thing. And that was when the benefits of a very rich education uh, came to the fore. 
because I had poets and scholars and theologians running around in my head to, to spend time with all day. Last question, right here. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to tell you a story that maybe connects to your experience, but when I was 10 or so, my mom came home and said, I'm gonna do a master's degree. And my sister and I were like, oh, you're gonna leave us here and go off to school? And she said, yes. And she said, and I'm gonna finish it by the time Will Steger finishes his expedition. And so for those years, our family tracked him and watched that um, unfold. And she did finish the same month that he finished. And it was an incredible experience. And my guess is there are plenty of folks who were tracking you and who were setting their goals around your incredible goals. So I just wanted to thank you for what you brought you. to us today. Thank you. Will, will, uh, will Steger traversed Antarctica in 1990, the year after our expedition. And I know the year because we laid in much of his dog food. <laughs> It was a good way to finance the trip. That's going to be our last question. Again, I thank all of you for coming out. And Terry, I thank you for sharing your incredible journey and your story. We have all been enlivened and encouraged and enriched by your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you.